Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave to talk about flying cars. Because where are the flying cars? I've been promised them my whole entire life. I want to go from one place in the city to another in the air. And it is so close, you can taste it, but it is still not quite here. To solve an engineering challenge this massive is gonna take bold ambition, iteration, and let's face it, tons and tons of test flights. And there is one company that is on a potential path to get us to the flying car, and they're called Archer Aviation. They've been developing an eVTOL, that stands for Electric Vertical Takeoff and Landing Aircraft, that is optimized for back-to-back 20-mile -back trips, but it has a range of 100 miles, perfect for a city. They recently invited us to witness and film a test flight of their autonomous electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicle known as Maker. So join us as we get under the hood with Archer Aviation's Tom Muniz and Matt Deal and find out just what it takes to engineer a craft like this. Tom, tell me about this vehicle here on our left. Yeah, absolutely. So this is Maker. This is Archer's demonstrator aircraft. Yeah. So what we're doing here is building electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. So if you think about today, moving around cities, right? We both live in the Bay Area in San Francisco. Yeah. You know how traffic can get, right? So the idea is we're taking technologies that people have developed over the last 15 or 20 years and they've applied them in automotive, but we're applying them in aerospace, right? So uh, Maker has 12 propellers, 12 electric motors, and we've put those together in this unique way to have an aircraft that can take off vertically like a helicopter, uh, but then after it takes off, it transitions to forward flight and flies like an airplane. So it's got the efficiency of an airplane, but the vertical takeoff and landing of a helicopter. Now, when it goes from that vertical to that forward motion, does it, because it's got a wing, it gains a whole bunch of efficiency, is that right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, the kind of concept of operations is, if you look at the aircraft, we've got this uh, row of six propellers yeah. on the front. So as you see them here, they're oriented for forward flight, but when the aircraft takes off, you can imagine them articulated about 90 degrees They've got a, each one of them has a hinge and they can all ice. Exactly, yeah. So uh, in takeoff, they're all pointed up, they all provide thrust, and then the aircraft gets off the ground. As soon as you're clear of obstacles, they start to articulate forward towards this configuration, and then the aircraft accelerates. And once you're above stall speed, then uh, all the lift you need is generated by the wing, and we're Amazing. just a really efficient uh, electric airplane. And and while that's a cockpit, no one goes in that cockpit, is that right? Correct, okay. yeah. So Maker is um, fully autonomous, so we do have a team on the ground that monitors the flights. Oh, so the team on the ground doesn't even fly the thing, they just watch what it does. Yes. Yeah, so uh, Maker uh, has pre-programmed flight plans, so essentially the pilot on the ground clicks a button to take off, and then there's a team of engineers that monitor the data, but the airplane's executing its flight plan wow. by itself. And you know it has contingencies baked in if something goes wrong and people on the ground can intervene if they need to, but- Big uh, stop buttons. And... Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, you can get in the control room and see the big stop everything button. But uh, yeah, no, it uh, executes the flight plan uh, totally by itself. And the reason for that is we're, we're going fast, right? We're doing new things, so we don't want to take any unnecessary risk, right? And yeah. that's like a cool thing about um, technology today, right? We don't need to put a pilot in the aircraft to do these sorts of things. Now, you have a lot of experience in this space, the VTOL space. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about how you got started in this, yeah. In this area? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was super lucky to get involved in this really early in my career. So uh, before joining Archer, I worked at another eVTOL company that was started in uh, early 2010. Um, so the story of how that happened is I was working as an aircraft designer for a small company up in the Bay Area uh, that was uh, owned by a Stanford professor. Mm -hmm. And Larry Page, one of the Google founders, reached out to us and had this idea for electric airplanes. So we did some you know, back of the envelope work for him and we thought, hey, you know, it's, it's pretty interesting, right? It might take a while for batteries to get better and motors to get better, but um, here we are you know, 12, 13 years later and uh, what, we're, what we're doing here is totally possible, right? It's just a matter of taking these building blocks and putting them together and then bringing in a product to market. So that's what we're focused on uh, here at Archer. So have you been, all this time, you've been designing stuff that will be possible as the motors and batteries improve? You're designing for the improvement? Um, in, in some ways, yes. In some ways, no. The, um, the way we think about it is the first product that we bring to market, which is our pilot plus four passenger vehicle mm -hmm. called Midnight, 
Um, that'll be like the worst vehicle that we ever bring to market because batteries <laughs> are getting better, right? Power electronics are getting better, motors are getting better. Yeah. And with each improvement, we just get better and better performance. So uh, Midnight, our product aircraft, when we bring it to market, we'll have a range of about 100 miles when it's brand new, brand new battery pack. About 60, 65 miles when it's, you know, batteries on its last legs, if you will. Uh, but if you think five, 10 years in the future, batteries are twice as good, now these airplanes can fly not just twice as far, but actually more like three times as far because uh, we keep a lot of energy uh, for reserves in right. the battery pack. So it's not like we, you know, run it down until it's, it's on fumes. Sure, fair right? enough. <laughs> yeah. Now, given that it's a plane, there's tons of redundancy built into this, right? Yeah. I, I know that plane systems often have two and three versions of every system. This is no different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That's another one of the really cool advantages of going electric like this is uh, if you compare this to say a helicopter, right? They typically have one or two really big gas turbine engines and say one big main rotor system. Mm -hmm. So what that means is there's hundreds of parts where if they fail, it's a catastrophic event for, for the vehicle. Uh, but since we can uh, distribute the propulsion and the powertrain around the aircraft, we're able to have these really high levels of redundancy and no uh, what are called critical parts, like the parts where if they fail, it's just game over. Uh, so Maker has 12 propellers, uh, 12 electric motors. Any of those can fail and the aircraft still flies totally fine, like full capabilities. We actually have six batteries as well. Any of those can fail, the aircraft still flies normally. So really it's the electric propulsion that lets us get the safety up to a place in line with commercial airliners, right? Which is what we think is required to really launch a product like this, right? And get public acceptance. Do you get uh, do you get noise reduction out of the increased number of propellers? Mm, so not quite. We have designed our vehicles to be very quiet. It's yeah. not not so much from the number of propellers as much as the design of the propellers. Um, like if you think about helicopters today, in many ways they can fly the same missions that we're flying, but why don't they? Because nobody wants a helicopter to land in their backyard right? nope. or next to their house. Well, I want a helicopter to land in my backyard, I, but I am unique. Yeah, you and I would, but yeah, my, my neighbors wouldn't, so I would. Uh, what you're seeing here with this little curve is both a feature to increase performance, but also to reduce noise. If you imagine um, what these propellers are doing when they're spinning, they're basically like little wings, yeah. right? Yeah. And they're just generating <clears throat> lift like a wing would. Mm -hmm. And so every wing that's moving through uh, the air generates a vortex, right? Off the tip of right. the propeller, where the air is spinning around from the high pressure side to the low pressure side, generating yeah. this like tornado, right? That comes off. So if you imagine that happening in a propeller, right? It's like this helix that's formed coming off the propeller tips. So there's a wake shed from this blade and you know, this blade's kind of spinning forward so they interact. It so hits the vortex from the exactly. preceding blade. Exactly. So if you imagine this like helix of wakes, right? So what this geometry does is essentially moves the vortex from this forward blade a little further downstream from this blade. And that both uh, reduces the kind of Wow. load the, or impulse that this blade sees to reduce noise, but also to increase efficiency. I, I feel like I knew intellectually how much wing design had to do with fluid dynamics, but it wasn't until this moment that I kind of grokked just how much. That's mm -hmm. amazing. And then so when we were talking about low noise, um, the other thing we do and probably the most important thing <laughs> is we spin the propellers more slowly than say a helicopter main rotor because, uh, you know, if you imagine the speeds at which this uh, like tip of the propeller blade, blade is traveling, it can yeah. be very high, right? And as you get closer and closer to the speed of sound, you get like local areas where this uh, flow is supersonic potentially. Right, right. And that's like super loud, right? All the shock waves that are generated. So uh, we keep the propeller tip speeds very low and that keeps the sound uh, so that it's not like the wop wop of a helicopter, but more just the air rushing, uh, rushing over the surface. Wow. I am curious how ready the public is to jump in these. You must be talking to people and finding out their appetite. I've always wanted flying cars. I'm so excited that they're almost here. Uh, what is the public's appetite for uh, autonomous robotic flying vehicles? Yeah, so um, that's a great question. And I think nobody really knows the answer, but I'll tell you what we think, right? So the first piece is we don't actually think it's autonomous to start. Uh, makers an autonomous aircraft but uh, it's almost impossible to certify an autonomous aircraft for oh. operations in the US today. 
Um, and even if you could, public acceptance would be kind of tough, right? Here, go sit in this robot airplane, it'll be fine. We've tested it a lot. I mean, maybe, right? Like yeah. you and I might do it, but maybe like my parents wouldn't do it, right? Um, so the product that we're bringing to market, Midnight, is a, a piloted aircraft. So it'll okay. have a pilot uh, up front and then two rows of two seats in it. Yeah, we Ooh. think having a pilot is an important factor in making people comfortable. Uh, but also, we uh, have a partnership with United Airlines where they're interested in connecting their passengers to long haul flights with vehicles like this. If you imagine oh. like um, you're in the city, right? Downtown San Francisco, and you got to fly it out of SFO. How cool would it be to check in down by the marina and zip down to SFO and then hop on your flight to DC or wherever you're going. So yeah. we are literally designing to the same safety standards as a commercial airliner. And the safety standards of a commercial airliner are insane. Yeah. I mean, I, I just remember sitting, uh, having been up close and personal. And so you guys are holding to every last bit of that level of strength and deflection and flexibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so to put numbers around it, what we're designing to is all of our critical systems can't fail more often than one in a billion flight hours. So this is a product. This is a product to supply a service. And it's a service that at this point is a very small niche market, but you guys are looking to expand it. Is that correct? Yeah, I guess um, the way we think about it is there's this uh, really great opportunity to get people like out of cars and off the ground and into the air to relieve congestion and just make it easier to move around. I love that out of cars and the next thing is into the air because that's air. where my brain goes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, no, but seriously, I mean, if you're sitting in like a traffic jam uh, on the highway, right? And you look up in the sky, if you're near a big city, you might see like one or two airliners, but there's really a lot of space there, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and with, uh, you know, technology today and the ability to um, really safely control and automate vehicles like this, right? If you think about, go down to the local electronics store and you buy a drone, right? And it's amazing how capable they are, right? Um, the, the idea is, wow, how could we, again, leverage these advancements in electric propulsion, apply them to a new sort of vehicle that can make uh, you know, people be able to move around much more quickly, uh, safely, uh, effectively through the sky. So are you also modeling how that service would be rolled out, how people would actually execute that service? Yeah, great question. Uh, we spend a lot of time on that. And that's really kind of the backbone of uh, the whole company and how we chose the aircraft that we're developing. So we started with uh, looking at how people move around cities today. We used publicly available <clears throat> cell phone tracking data yeah. that shows where people are going, um, what time of day, et cetera. Wow. And then we looked at, hey, which of those trips could we potentially address with the vehicle? Yeah. And if so, what sort of vehicle do we want? How far does it need to go? How fast does it need to go? Because uh, end of the day, the, the name of the game is saving people time, right? If it right. takes you longer to fly somewhere in one of these, it's probably not likely that you're going to take it. But if it saves you time and it's accessible and it's affordable, um, which again, it can be because of the electric powertrain and yeah. simplicity, um, then it's like a really compelling, compelling product, right? So. Uh, some people think like, oh, are you talking about the Jetsons, right? We get that a lot. And I mean, who knows, right? If you think far enough into the future, maybe it is something like yeah. that. But if you're more like pragmatic and think more near term, it's um, in many ways, it's just like a helicopter 2.0, right? right? Except it's right. lower cost, it's much safer and it's much quieter, right? Well, the, I, you know, I'm coming down here. I know that I'm talking to folks who built an airplane from scratch and uh, uh, it's, a, it's a product, it's a new object, but I hadn't thought that you are also building a whole service industry also from scratch yeah. in order to, to utilize this. That's amazing. Yeah, there's a whole another side of the business on that as well, right? So uh, I focus mostly on developing the aircraft and manufacturing the aircraft, but uh, our mission is to both sell vehicles, right. uh, but also operate them ourselves, right? So you could imagine a future where you get out uh, your phone and you book yourself a trip from downtown San Francisco to right. San Jose for a meeting or whatever it is, or to SFO to get your flight. So. Yeah. In the same of, so in the same way that like some of the mapping software which began as scrappy little folks trying to get you where you want to go as fast as you can now have to accommodate for their own traffic they're generating with their software. Mm -hmm. You guys are thinking of a future way past just like a few of these in a the city but how they interact when there's multiple product lines, mul hundreds of people using these hopefully. Yeah, absolutely. And it'll be a phased phased approach, right? Sure. So, you know, we're going to market with a piloted aircraft. It'll be flown just like a helicopter or another mm -hmm. airplane is flown today. 
the pilots will call ATC, right, if they need to, to yeah. land at the airport. Uh, but, you know, if this takes off and the market materializes, like we think, then, uh, yeah, it's um, pretty interesting to think about uh, lots of autonomous versions of these, right, end of the decade or next decade, and them coordinating to do these, like, really complex uh, networks, right, to really get the utilization up. So Maker here is a prototype. Yes. Uh, but eventually you guys want to make thousands, tens of thousands of these, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. What does that pipeline look like for manufacturing? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. Um, again, we're trying to be really pragmatic about that. So going back to the FAA and kind of uh, partnership there, we don't want to push the envelope too hard on manufacturing too soon, right? Sure. We don't want to take too much risk. So uh, Maker, our prototype here, uses uh, tons of traditional aerospace materials, uh, traditional aerospace manufacturing processes, and that works great. Uh, we're going to carry a lot of those forward into midnight, the first product. Uh, but yeah, like you're saying, a lot of that doesn't scale to producing thousands or even more aircraft per year. So uh, one of our partners is uh, Stellantis, which is the new name for the merger of Fiat Chrysler and, and Peugeot. So one of the world's largest auto manufacturers. Wow. And if you think about, you know, if we're successful and the market materializes here, in many ways, manufacturing should look more automotive than, than aerospace. Uh, so we work with them uh, quite a bit on design for manufacturing, uh, setting up our factory layout for this aircraft uh, production, right? Industrial engineering, those things that they're really skilled at uh, to set ourselves up to be really successful to ramp up manufacturing uh, long term here. Amazing. So bringing the, the, the safety factors of aerospace engineering, but the, the cost effective uh, factors of auto engineering. Yeah, exactly. And, um, you know, it's interesting in aerospace, the volumes are just traditionally low and that just drives you to like different techniques, right? You do right. a lot of inspection of everything, right? And in automotive, you make so many, it's just like not possible. So you need to design the processes to have like inherent quality right. inside them, right? And moving towards that in a very incremental but safe way is a super cool challenge that uh, we're focused on. What's fascinating about it to me is it's so much more than just designing a simple product. You're also having to design its market and its manufacturing. None, neither, none yeah. of those exist yet. So yeah. it's all coming out of whole cloth. Absolutely. And I'm an airplane guy, so I love the airplane part. But honestly, <laughs> it's almost the easier part compared right, to right, everything right. else, right? Um, we'll be rolling out to, to the pad, uh, doing another envelope expansion test today. So we're right in the middle of our forward speed flight envelope uh -huh. test. So when I say flight en envelope, what I mean is um, there's a certain range of uh, conditions that we know how the aircraft performs because we have test data there. Right, right. I mean, I know this is your job and you guys are spinning this up all the time to gather this data, but it must be a thrill every time you spin it up. Yeah, absolutely. This is, uh, <laughs> this is the sixth full scale aircraft like this that I've worked on, but yeah. it's like just as exciting every time. Really? Like the first flights are just as exciting. Every time I come down here and get to see one, it's uh, I'm like an airplane guy, right? right, so I, just, right. I just love it, right? It's, it's so awesome to see these things fly. So it doesn't matter how amazing your software is for designing stuff or how great your engineers are, you still have to test stuff. And that's what we just witnessed. Maker just uh, ran through a seven minute flight test. It rose up to 80 feet, flew out half a mile, turned around, came back uh, and then landed. And 
Uh, there are some very small perturbations we saw coming back that was actually all part of the test. Uh, what blows me away is it's just you can kind of tell there's no pilot there. It just rises up and its stability is just something. I mean, watching it rise off was very precise. It was neat to watch. I think we're about a thousand feet from there. Impressively quiet for, for, for what we just witnessed. All right, Matt, we just saw this thing fly for the first time, but you watch this happen like every single day. It's true. And you've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these. You could, you could say hundreds. Hundred, thousands? <laughs> Maybe not thousands. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is it still exciting to watch it take off every time? Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> what are the delineating factors? Uh, it depends on what we're doing. When we're doing something new, it's always fun. How long have you been with this project? I started at the beginning of the Maker program in January of 2020. Wow. And uh, tell me how that came about. Tell me how this group of engineers got together and sure. started putting this on paper. Yeah, so a bunch of us came from a, a different eVTOL company. It was a program by Airbus called Vahana. Mm -hmm. um, that program ended in late 2019, and this was just getting started. So a bunch of us came over and we wanted to keep working together. So joined oh, up on the next thing. Yep. Oh, fascinating. So at the very beginning of something like this, I, I always love thinking about the stretch of time. Like I look at this and I know that it is the result of literally millions of tiny decisions. That's right. But at the very beginning, are you working with just a blank piece of paper and arguing over how many rotors? Pretty much, yep. Wow. That's the fun thing about a clean sheet design. We start with literally a clean sheet and we start tackling the problem, making those little decisions one at a time to come up with eventually the full system here. So what is the next phase of testing? You guys are doing these small flights. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the next development stage? Yeah, so we're doing what we call envelope expansion. So mm -hmm. we're starting from hover. We just hover in place and right. you know do some things around the taxiway here. Um, but what you just saw was part of our speed envelope expansion. So we're incrementally going faster and faster and faster. And a lot of things are happening as we do that. So you notice the tilts, we take off with the tilts vertical, mm -hmm. and as we get faster, they come down. Yeah. The blades, the pitch of the blades coarsens. Um, so that's why we take it off piece by piece, so that any, anything doesn't look right, we can always come back to a slower speed and keep the aircraft safe. And with each of these tests, every time you're adding an increment, you are monitoring all the systems really carefully to see if anything's dif different or changing. That's right, and before we even get there, we simulate it, right? So we, we know what we think we're gonna see, and we know what we saw at the previous speed. Yeah. So we expect to see the behavior pretty similar. And if anything looks off, we knock it off, come back home. Have you had some spectacular differences between <laughs> the simulated test and the actual test? I wouldn't say spectacular. <laughs> okay, good. But That's it, a good it, it is a good thing. <laughs> but there are definitely differences. Uh, it's, it's, you know, order of magnitudes of oscillations or things like that. Um, it's pretty much what you expect right. between simulation and the real world. I mean, within normal aerospace development, there's always accommodation for things, for the vibrations and the, all right. of that kind of expansions, the temperature stuff. Right. Uh, that's all sort of built into the, the, the whole industry in and of itself. Exactly. Yep. And that's why we test. Um, do you have, like, when, if you, when you bring your family by, do you have a part of this that you like, I just got to show you this, this is my favorite part? Uh, I do. You can't really see it. No. <laughs> so the inside of these uh, forward hubs, yeah. there's the variable pitch mechanism. It's for the, beautiful. For the blades? That's right. It's beautiful. Really? Oh, yeah. What makes it beautiful? Uh, it's a very simplistic design with yeah. very little mechanical slop. Um, and it does it, it does it adjust the pitch on all of them simultaneously? All these blades, yes. And so can you describe it to me? I want to see if I can understand it in my head. I mean, we might have to cut it later for the, the secret sauce. <laughs> oh, sure. I don't want to give away anything. <laughs> oh, so it's your proprietary design for the pitch that's adjustment. Right. Oh, that's neat. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. So it is, and it's very little slop. That's right. Which is shocking given how much force it's under. Exactly. And that's hugely important because all of our models at about how much thrust we're producing rely on very accurate knowledge of the pitch of those blades. And re reducing slop, I mean, the temperature's gonna change too at speed and under all sorts of different circumstances. Sure, so there's, that's there's a lot to Oh, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> I, hope we, I hope we can keep this in the video because I love this kind of talk. <laughs> uh, so how close is the next iteration, Midnight, it, which is already being developed, yes? That's right, yep. Uh, how, how, how close am I to being able to be a, a passenger in Midnight? Well, before you can be a passenger, we need to get type certified. Of We're course. looking at 2024 for type certification. And at that point, we'll start entry into operations. It'll be pretty low rate, but somewhere in the 2024, 2025 timeframe. Wow. So 
even when, when, when I think your definition of fast is different than my definition of fast, because that seems like a long timeline, but I realize for a piece of aircraft that cannot fall out of the sky, that That's is right. probably an incredibly That's tightened incredibly timeline. Fast. That's right. Tell me about this, this V tail. So this uh, accomplishes the functions of both the vertical tail and the horizontal stabilizer that you may see in other more common general aviation aircraft. Um, but it's the same idea. Um, what we're looking at here, too, we have uh, three independent rudder vaders. So okay. that's the rudder and the elevator combined wow. into one control surface. And we have three of them for redundancy. So we could lose one. They're all independently actuated. Oh, lose one okay. or it could be stuck hard over and we'd still be able to control the aircraft adequately. Does the increased number of them give you, ex like if they're all working, does that give you extra control options? Not really. Not okay. with this aircraft anyway. So we use them all together. So I when see. they're all you know, they normally function together. But the whole goal is redundant, redundant, redundant. That's right. That yep. so much of this can fail and it still stays exactly. up. Exactly. That's amazing. Yep. I have to say for me, just watching that first hover and then literally how it just literally stops in the air, I found <gasps> it, it made my, took my breath away. Great. Matt, thank you so much, man. Thank it's you. It's a beautiful machine. Thanks. Thanks again to Archer Aviation for making this video possible. It was thrilling to watch their machine fly and even more thrilling to think about the future that it portends. I mean, I've been promised a flying car for almost my entire life. So to see one, it is easy to get lost in the excitement and think there's the future. But I talk to the teams and I am reminded that it's all about people. People not just making a flying vehicle, they are also building a market and a manufacturing system for being able to make this thing at scale. That's all really exciting to me, the personal element. So thanks for bringing me out, Archer, and I can't wait till I can take a flying car.